Lord Jesus, you are the God of all, and we worship you. Manifest your love. Show forth your power. In Jesus' name, and everybody said. Amen. So we're in our series on receiving from God, and I must say the last Thursday, God did some incredible things in people's lives. Last Thursday's message, um, God just had several people tell me how God had really just kind of ministered to me. You could see it, and it was a, there was a, just a sense of his presence that was just fantastic, and we thank him for that. So we again draw on that. And I also want to thank Aaron for singing for us and being a part of our sharing the pleasure of the Holy Spirit. Uh, last week we said that to receive from the Lord at the altar, we have to leave the agendas, let go, and let God. Uh, and that was great for some. Some people was able to, to do so. And we saw God move. But how do you let go is really what I want to touch on today. Because I think that's key. In other words, what mindset is necessary? Because you can come forward for prayer, you can come to church for prayer, you have your own agendas, your thoughts, what have you, but what, what is our mindset supposed to be to really receive from the Holy Ghost? Because we do know that our God, our Heavenly Father, looks to bestow on, on us good gifts according to Matthew 7, verse 11. So who here wants to truly receive from the Lord this morning? First part of it is wanting. You have to have a desire. So turn with me to Mark 6, starting in verse 1. And can we close those doors in the back so we can perhaps drop the temperature in here? You know what I find fascinating? You ladies wear short sleeve shirts and then you complain it is cold. Next Sunday it will be as cold, if not colder. Perhaps investing in longer sleeves and or shawl or a magenta quilt. Like it. Anything you need to stay warm while we men sweat the future. Mark 6, verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, say hometown, hometown, accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came in church, he was beginning to teach in his synagogue, and many heard him and were amazed. And they asked, where did this man get these things? What's the wisdom that has been given to him? What, what are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, Simon? Aren't his sisters, yes, sisters, here with us? And they were offended. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Now, I have slammed the American church a lot as of late because of the sin and compromise that has snuck into the church that some pastors have actually made peace with. I believe it might be my prophetic anointing that is so offended at what could be, but because of what has been, the church struggles to see, and that is, of course, that it is about Jesus, his ways, and not ours. And it's really that simple. Can I get an amen? amen? But I want to talk today about God, what God is doing in the world as a whole. If you take a look, you'll see that I've heard of revivals breaking out of Venezuela, Argentina, Africa, and all these places where God is doing these creative miracles, filling people's teeth by holes of rotted teeth they couldn't afford dentistry with substance that science hasn't been able to figure out. Some people actually got told. In Venezuela, if you don't have at least three teeth that have been filled, Miraculously, they won't even let you testify. Open ears, blind eyes, all this, all this wild stuff. And we can say, well, of course, of course, of course, they're ignorant savages. <laughs> of course, the Lord is going to have to do something for those poor schmucks. We have Blue Cross Blue Shield. What do we need a miracle for? And you can, of course, just go to your doctor and have him give you a bill for everything. I know for myself, I remember the uh, charismatic renewal of the 70s and watching 
my cousin's leg actually grow. You know, you can fake some miracles, I suppose, but we have, of course, the x-rays to prove that her leg actually grew right in front of us. My mother had a creative miracle in which she has x-rays of, in which bone just grew. You know, bone is always growing. Um, I heard people's hearing being restored and all of these exciting things. And but nowadays, I just can't stop wondering what happened to once was. Maybe I'm, because I'm 50 now and you start to wax, you know, now, about the days of going by. Fall oh, down the beauty aisle, I pick up a comb, and I dream. I remember when I used to hate to leave me. Loving you. I'm sorry. Barbara Streisand. Memories like the corners of my mind. You know, good times. Um, what happened? What happened to God? That's the thought. The problem is this. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's us. You know, Matthew 13, 18 says, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I feel as if God has kind of, well, led me to this passage today for one reason. And that's really to point out the why and what happened. First, there was a hunger for more. People were not afraid to pay the price for what they were asked of God to pay. You know, we've got this movie coming out called Detroit, in which it talks about the 67 politically correct positioning on whatever happened. I don't know, you can't call it a riot, because now they, they want to change it from a riot to a political disobedience to a, a upri uprising, is that the term? Rebellion, yeah, okay. I was there, uh, it was a riot. Uh, I was under a couch, if I remember correctly. I don't, my parents would remind me. My dad had a 22 aimed at one door, and my mom had a shotgun aimed at the other one. We lived on Phillips and Wavy back in the day, he saw it. By the Texas Cafe, downtown. My point in all of that is this. Not that I'm in agreement with, of course, their positioning on green sleeves and the blind pig. And that really wasn't really the issue. Really, 42 riots were really the much more racially motivated ones when a bunch of workers at you know, the auto, I won't mention their name, factories, they didn't want to work with black people. And so it was a riot then. 67 was over a blind pig. About for those of you who are not hip to that, that's a place where you go after bars are closed to get drugs and have sex with people and all kinds of things. Well, I have cops and say, show up, I have a drink after work. So that's kind of how that went down. Um, my point was, is what caused that mindset? Because it wasn't just there. There were things going on in Berkeley in the 60s. Um, you had the rise of Detroit, you had L.A. Uh, you had, uh, well, you had all the wonderful things going on down in Mississippi and Alabama and all of those places. And um, there was something about people back then that they had come to a crescendo in their mindset of a hunger for something different. And they did not know how to handle it correctly, in my opinion, due to the fact that, of course, Detroit still looks like it does. Probably not the best way to handle it. Never burn down your own neighborhood because you're mad at somebody else. First rule. Even if somebody else is the person who owns the home that you're going to end up having to rent from anyhow, only this time you have holes in the wall. It's just not a smart position. But um, people can get pushed and crushed and abused to a point that they will lash out. Now the key is this. To get them to reach out or react in a positive way to bring change. And this is not a commentary on politics. Um, this is really a commentary on the politics of heaven. You have to get tired of the racist position of Satan against you as a human being. 
his abuse of you, his attacks on you and your personhood, on your culture. You gotta get tired and sick and tired of him doing what he's doing and then not respond in the way that he wants you to. I said this since we're already out on a limb here. Um, I was teaching in uh, a high school up the road, I won't mention the name of it. And I was teaching on moral and ethics with another pastor who was uh, of African American descent. There's all kinds of new words now coming up for that. You know, I don't know. I was listening to, uh, who were we listening to, Chris? What was that guy, the, the actor? Uh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. What an interesting individual. He was talking about how do you get over racism? He says you first of all stop talking about it and start treating people the same. And I was like, shut your mouth! <laughs> wow. Just saved us millions of dollars on that research in Congress and Senate and hearings. But my point is this. I was there and there was two young boys that had, uh, I shouldn't say boys, I can't say this, but correct, two young males. Uh, I don't know how I'm gonna get into this message done now. So careful. But um, they got in a fight. And I said to the one kid, I said, why did you, why did you get in a fight? He said, well, he called me the N-word. And I was sitting next to a, a black pastor and I said, there you are. And he, in the black pastor, he almost choked on his tongue, you know. And he said, excuse me? I said, there's no excuse for it. You are. Did he call you something to elicit a behavior from you that he wanted? Were you a slave to his desires? He said, yeah, I guess so. He said, well, then you are what he called you. I said, when he called you that, you should have ignored it because that's not who you are. That's not your person. That doesn't define you. You should have walked right past him. But instead, you did the very thing that he wanted, and therefore you are what he called you. The black pastor pulled me up and said, you can't say that. I said, <laughs> I did. Because that's how it works. But he did something because he was offended. When are you folks going to get offended at Satan's behavior of you? And do something positive about it. Past the tacit sense and mental gymnastics that you go through so that the miraculous power of God can come forth. When are you going to fight for something that matters outside of a word? Oh, you ain't gonna like me, I'm here. I make no good. We've got to deal with the realities, ladies and gentlemen, that we are under tremendous oppression of demonic force <laughs> that is contended with only through the power of the Holy Spirit and the supernatural. We must, instead of react, respond to the attacks against society, against people, against the way that we're being treated. And it isn't through negotiation. It isn't through riots. But it's through wrestling against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness that will bring the change that God has called us to. Now, why did I say all of that? First of all, everyone is now white. <laughs> and engaged. Um, people back in the 60s and the 70s with all of the transitions that were going on, that also did build within the church this mentality I'm talking about. People literally were offended at how the church had become rather staid and dry. And that's really what brought on the charismatic renewal. And this is when there was miracles and signs and wonders like you see, it says in Mark 16, 17, 18, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out devils, they will speak with their tongues, they will take up serpents if they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. <coughs> but they were willing to pay a price. The people in Berkeley, although I think they were slightly askew in their thought processes, paid with their lives. In Detroit, I think there was over 1,500 people injured 
in the right. There were all kinds of costs that people were willing to pay for what they believed in. Be it correct and or incorrect in the hot mess that left and all of that. But they were willing to do something. What are you willing to do to see what you read about in the Bible, assuming you've been reading? These types of miracles manifest the power and prove our position in life. But they have a cost, and that's death to self, and openness to allow God to use the gifts as he sees fit whenever he wants. And it's usually when you're in a hurry at the grocery store, pumping gas, or on your way someplace else. God seems to interrupt our agendas. I've had long conversations with people. Let me back up for just a second and listen to me. Before we get too far in this message, I don't want anyone to feel guilty about this message, but rather convicted to pursue more with God than you ever have before. For guilt does not help people to grow. I'm not trying to guilt people, but reveal something of value, which is you in Him. I'm not trying to place shame or blame on anyone. I've rubbed my dog's nose in their poop, and of course they've stopped pooping in the house, but they never understood why. Because see, guilt can stop someone's behavior for a time, but it cannot really fully explain the why. It only gives one side of the why. It doesn't enhance someone's understanding, and this is key, for God is not looking for robots in the church, but for children who trust Him in the kingdom. So follow me today. As we look in Mark 6, 5 through 6. Jesus marveled at how his family and friends had less faith in him than those who didn't know him. This verse in the Bible has been my bane and my solace. Look it up. For my ministry and the balance between friendship with those you minister to and familiarity that leads to contempt has been a challenge and I have faced this my whole life. To be as close as Jesus was to his disciples and followers and not so close that they don't recognize his anointing is a balance that not even, even Jesus himself, obviously, could master. I know they might offend you, but that is what happened. They could not. And it blew his mind. If we get too friendly, people lose the respect needed to receive our purpose as pastors to the church. To mature you into the image of Christ, to rebuke you in your sin, to direct you in your purpose, and encourage you in your goals. And that's our job, purpose, destiny, and life goal. We're going to first, or second Timothy 4 2, Luke 4 8, Hebrews 13 17, and 1 Thessalonians 5 11. Yet we have to be close enough to be approachable, but not venerated, where you have to kiss my ring. So the issue in our text is how those who knew him saw him. Because they knew Jesus, but they knew him the wrong way. Is it possible you know Jesus the wrong way? Is he your black Jesus, white Jesus, American Jesus, Polish Jesus, Albanian, Hungarian Jesus? Which one is he? Or can Jesus just be himself? Without any of your agendas. Oh, Hispanic. They didn't know Jesus. They knew him the wrong way and perceived or thought they knew they had known him all along. And that kept them from truly perceiving who Jesus really was. And he marveled at this since you would assume that the more you know someone, the easier it would be to receive from them because you've got a relationship. But that isn't so. Relationships go like this. Introduction, no trust. Conversation, some trust. Relationship, What happens is that familiarity leads to a mindset of what we talked about before, yada. 
pigeonholing a person in their other person's mind to the point that they think they can know what to expect when interacting with a person. And the problem for some is knowing someone in their minds is their first step to controlling the other person and what they expect from them. See, relationship leads to control. I want you to be the way I want you to be because that's the way I want you to be. And it's not always verbal, it's more just the way that they approach people and the facial expressions and the double entendres and the way they influctuate their voice on the syllables. Because in America we use words to manipulate, not communicate, and what we're telling you is how I want you to respond to me, and if I like or do not like what you have to say, then of course my facial expression will be such that it will patronize you with a fake smile while saying things that you shouldn't say out of your mouth we say in our heads. It's been the most incredible challenge. I've watched pastors, and they, they gave up. Most pastors today have given up on being pastors. They have tried to do what parents have done with their children and destroy children today, and that was become their friend. Amen. That is what happened. Yeah. And so you have these churches where the pastor preaches the Bible, but they have very little credibility as someone who's actually saying something of any sort of supernatural power. They've become just more or less a recording of, or a echo of what God had already said with no sense of any respect for what they do. And look at the way they dress. From skinny jeans to shorts and a t-shirt on a Sunday. And you say, well, pants, we're not supposed to be all caught up in our clothing. No, I mean, we're not going to receive a robe of righteousness, a crown, You know, I've laughed at the church, they argue over things like that, but people know what's decent. Nobody here goes for a job interview in a tank top and a pair of booby shorts. Unless you're working at Hooters. Just saying. So it hurt. They've got great wings, they say. Great wings. You dress for an occasion. And this message is not about dressing up. It is not about the black and white issue. This is not a political statement. So if you stop there at any of these positions, you have been totally and completely led astray by false presuppositions. I want to show you why there isn't the power that there should be in the church today. It is human nature to look to establish safe zones around us as adults. Areas and ways to deal with people who we do not want to be hurt by, we are afraid of, or we know nothing about. So we look to pigeonhole them so that we can deal with them in a way that makes us feel safe and empowered. This is why Jesus ate with anyone he met. Why I believe I'm such a food guy. I can sit with any culture at any time and if I know a little bit about their food, I can bridge a gap to build a relationship. There you go. But if you meet someone straight up, there will be, of course, a propensity for their bigotry. Uh, everyone has it. Amen. Amen. To view that person through a eye of, I must protect myself and walls. But there's something about sitting down to a meal that drops the walls. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Has anyone else noticed? Crazy. How did they do that? What is it about food that pretty much brings people together? The common union meal. Centered around taste. The better the meal, the more the conversation seems to flow. Unless, of course, it's really bad, then everyone complains about how bad the cook was. Everywhere Jesus went, he engaged with people on a certain level. And in human nature, the people who knew him the best were the ones who had the biggest walls against him. Yet he never sinned. Never. Never offended anyone purposely from the position of angst. But stay with me, I'm going to show you the problem with this protectionism mindset. 
And also, please keep in mind, whenever you see a person of power, influence in the spirit world, keep in mind that what they had to go through to get it, and the rejection, and the hurt, and the misunderstanding, and the challenge, for that should be part of how you view them. Because you need to empathize with their situation, not look to discount it when they look to manifest their purpose, because that is what happened to Christ, and here's why. Anointing does not come cheaply. So no, Jesus or anyone chosen and anointed of God to lead is one thing, but you can know them the wrong way. And that can keep you from the power that comes from truly knowing them that was sent to minister to you. So I want you to follow, because we're going to back up for just a minute. Apologetics and theology. You see people trying to argue all the time. Facebook is a wonderful place to get messed up theology. But, um, what color was Moses' dog? And people were going to read in Hebrew on this concept. And some cat people are offended by that. And, but people go into these long dissertations arguing about this and arguing about that. And I used to do it. I, 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 I loved R.C. Stroll and I'd read Toes or I'd read all of these, you know, Ravi Zacharias. You have to always have it with a little bit of Indian in the way you speak. And it sounds more important. But um, apologetics and theology and religious argument is great when discussing Jesus from a perspective of mental ascent. But but if that's your total perspective on God, you rob God from being who God wants you to be, or what he wants to be to you, and that's experiential. See, the Nazarenes knew Jesus, but the spirit of Nazareth, of home, of familiar, turns Jesus into a historical figure instead of a relevant relational ruler. We have over-educated ourselves in knowing Jesus to the point that we don't know him anymore. It says, in Nazareth he could only do a few miracles. And that's where many of us live today in the few moments that keep us doctrinally sound, but theologically unsensible. We see a few things happen here and there. We try to remember, yeah, 10 years ago, I didn't pay a bill and I didn't have any money and I tithed and someone sent me a check. 10 years ago. I prayed for someone one time, they got over a cold. We have enough to keep us doctrinally sound, but not theologically satisfied and satiated. And so what do we do? We come here and hope pastor will be able to stir up something. So you'll have something to see and hang on to a faith that you're hanging on by a thread. Expecting God to do for you what God says He only does for those who love Him, not want to use Him for when they're in trouble only. And I contend it's because we do know too much about Him in theory and not enough in experience to the point that we are afraid to be that vulnerable as adults. Could you imagine I started picking you people? out right now and having you stand up here and just having you begin to praise God. To think about everything he's done and just have you stand up here and just tell everybody here about what he's done in your life. Amen. You would freak out. Don't be man. I'm not safe. If I recognize your voice, you'll be standing. We are afraid to be that vulnerable adult with someone we can't control or pigeonhole in our understanding. So we have overemphasized getting to know him theologically and have ignored the experience so that he becomes a historical figure of the past while we try to walk forward into our future. So let me ask, how do you know Jesus as an American? or as a religious Nazarene, or something else, which leads to the question, how do you even overcome? Is it possible 
to know him the wrong way and to know too much about him but not know him. Theory is fabulous. Experience is so much more. I can theologically break down chocolate to you. But do we have any chocolate people who can say an amen if I just hand it out a nice box if you die? Come on, see. I've got some other people here. You're not bougie, you'll just take the, of course, peanut M&Ms in a large five-pound bag and judge me. I'm hip to you. Peanut butter. I know. Red bags. I don't like all that fancy chocolate. Yeah, so just give me my M&M in a five-pound on a shame bag. Leave me in a dark room and don't talk. There you go. Make sure it's a red bag. Or yellow. How can we overcome this thought process towards him so he can come into our lives and not occasionally, on a consistent basis, to constantly be wow. My dream sometimes is to, to experience him like the 24 elders that fall down before him because he keeps revealing himself in every moment and he shows them something in every second, something new about him, and they fall down and cry, holy, holy, holy. To be constantly in a position of spiritual satisfaction. We get that. Two verses. Matthew 19, 14. Jesus said, but suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And then in Matthew 18, 2 through 4, calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn, 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 change your thinking, repent, 180 degrees. And people are like the Polish guy who said, let's make a change, let's do a 360 and get out of here. <laughs> Yes, I will abuse all nations. <laughs> I think I'm offended. Somebody explain it to the Polish. <laughs> Unless you turn and become like children, you will <coughs> never enter the kingdom of heaven. Who humbles himself like this child is the greatest. King of God. But look at that last verse. How do you humble yourself like a child? Look, I gotta be honest with you. This scares me a bit. For I struggle to have fun like a child. I struggle with having fun. I really do. It is, it is a challenge I have. I used to know how. But now I have been an adult in dealing with extreme adult issues for so long, it's hard to truly invest like a child. If you go into the nursery, it's fascinating. The reason why the teachers come out of there exhausted and horrified is because they realize, one, they are not a child. Two, they don't have the energy. Three, some people shouldn't breathe. But that's another story. It's totally another. You can't discuss that in church. That's, there are demons. But the point is, you watch these little kids. I was watching Dr. Stambolski's child throw himself against the wall and just go like this for like 10 minutes. I, I don't know what that was. Another little kid just stood there, talking to the wall. <laughs> I didn't even know what he was talking to. <laughs> Full blown cover, anyone interrupt? <laughs> little girls, as soon as you put on a dress that has any flow to it, immediately you have to turn and do this. <laughs> and they watch it. So, Look at it. Spin. Then they fall down. I watched the minute. Blatant disregard that the pastor of the church 
It's there, they didn't care. <laughs> I enter the room expecting to hear <laughs> The vicar has arrived. They're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and then they pick up a toy and hit someone on the head. Whoosh. What was that for? I don't know. I'm a child. They run for no reason. They'll just be sitting there. They must run and they run back and forth. Run, back and forth. Run, run. Why are you running? I don't know. I should run. And you sit there, you watch that, and you're like, what's wrong with these children? Don't they realize how undignified they're behaving? Don't they understand the pressures of going on and what's going on in the political world? They're depressed. <laughs> Unsettled. <clears throat> we have not passed a good health care bill. They should be devastated. They're like, we have to eat more crackers and more jelly. <laughs> They're more upset about the fact that we ran out of fruit snacks. My God, that's just protest. They almost had a riot. I'm serious, but they called it, of course, a political uprising. <laughs> they have blatant disregard of it. Don't you understand? They have bills to pay and they're footed. They don't care. They just want to enjoy life. We have a mixed church. I watch black kids and white kids play together. I have never once looked at the other one and said, Do you know my dad used to own your people? Never see it. They never say nothing. They just hug each other and jump up and down and play and they don't think, oh, we're not supposed to like each other. All that stuff. Never happens. You never see all the black kids over here and all the white kids over here, the Latino people trying to crawl in over the wall, you know, it's like, you know, little kids, they're trying to get underneath the little thing, you know, you put up a gate, they, they start protesting, so they, they dug underneath there. And they're trying to get you never see any of that. Why? Because all of those things were created not by God. And they distract from who he is. And they understand that we're to love each other. And they get caught up in political nonsense. They don't get into that. They don't care. They don't even understand it. Do you know that that kid over there is Hispanic? No, he's just my friend. That's all I know. Right. That's all I want to know. Right. Do you know his history? We don't care. The black people that, you know, we used to own them in Alabama. I don't care. All I know is that he's my friend and we like to share snacks. That's all they know. And God says that's where our mindset needs to be. You know, I look for ways to stay childlike in enjoyment, and it, it really is hard work. Because these kids, if you watch them, they invest 100% into everything. They eat their snacks, the fruit snacks. You should watch them. They're like gerbils or something. And they consume them at such speed and intensity that they chip them in their face. One falls on the ground, 30 seconds will I don't know. I like a little rock in there, it's crunchy. It gives me texture and umami. It's the umaminess of it. It's what you don't understand the concept. They run to sit in their car and sit shotgun. I got shotgun, I got shotgun. They'll push, they'll break each other's legs and poke out an eye just to sit next to the person driving. And that's the first person who, of course, people in the front of the first ones that die in an accident. You want everyone else, you don't play so. They spit watermelon seeds. Everything without risk or without concern for failure. But no regard for responsibility to do well or how they look. 
They don't care how people define them. And they'll also run their relationships with total abandon. They make friends quickly and don't hold grudges for long, even though they will fight over 50 times within one church space. Work the nursery. One minute, I hate her. And you don't have to. Next minute, they're hugging each other. Like mine, good lord, it's like a marriage. <laughs> Did that come out? I'm under the anointing. I'm not my responsibility. That was God. One minute they don't like each other, he's like, Gunky, I don't like him, I like him. Oh, he has snacks. <laughs> snacks really are the answer to everything. <laughs> but everything is 100% and no grudges. Could you imagine if you live life 100% with no grudges? But the adult, being a Nazarite dweller in mindset, causes us to look at life from a fear-based familiarity instead of a childlike mentality. So what I'm saying is, is the price to pay to attain the power and the spirit <coughs> involves being childlike, and the price to be like that is key. For in dying to self, we feel that we can, of course, place ourselves in a position where he becomes our everything. Dying to who we feel we need to be instead of being who God told us to be opens us up to the power of him. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, defines true love, says love believes all things, endures all things, keeps no record of wrong, suffer. But how do you get there? How do you love life like a child and live carefree knowing that he cares for you? How do you get to that point? I mean, I'm 50 years old. That means I've been mature for like 10 years now. And it's been really tough getting back. It's, uh, the immaturity of my 40s. You remember those, don't you, Derek? Yeah. I know you're trying to relive them again. But that's... How do you get back to getting back? And back to Morgan Freeman, which is fascinating. First I listened to all interview, he said, first of all, to get over racism, stop talking about it. First thing he said, stop talking about it, stop feeding into it. As a matter of fact, stop calling me a black man. And he, the interview was a Jewish guy. I can't say Jew, that would be offensive, although I so I can offend myself, I guess. Then I'd have to be angry with myself and I'd be over by the time I'm so I'm going to A complication is the other. He says, I'm not going to look at you as a Jewish person. I don't want you to look at me as a black person. Why don't you just look at me as a person? I'll look at you as a person and we'll just be people. And what if we did the same thing with God? See, when we look at God, we look at God as the God of disappointment, the God of what could be, the God of what should be, the God that pastor preaches, the God that T.D. Jakes preaches, the God that whoever else you listen to, hopefully not too many other people like that. And God almost never gets to be God. Because in our minds, he has to be a certain way. He has to be a certain thing, and I heard... He does this, and I heard, first of all, anytime you hear what he's supposed to be like, it's probably wrong. <coughs> it's what you read in the Bible is your basis. That's phase one. Always. Phase two would be your experience. Phase one should be your work. If you get that out of skew, you're in deep trouble. But, Let's get back. Mark 9, 33. This is how to get back to the miraculous. They came to Capernaum when he was in the house. He asked, what are you arguing about on the road? So there was some sort of discussion, and Jesus asked them what they were arguing about. Jesus already knew. But Jesus never asked for information. He always asked for revelation. And the revelation was never to him, it was to the people, of course, who were following him. He put everybody on blast. 
But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Who was the most spiritually sound. And they realized once they were, of course, held accountable to the foolishness of their position, that there was a better way. The reason why a lot of people don't like to come to church and hear pastors <coughs> preach the word is because it causes you to look at you. One of my biggest horrors in life would be on a reality show where I could relax enough to forget that there are going to be a million people watching me on a, on, a, on a camera. Can you imagine if there was a camera following you around all the time? My whole week put out on film for you all to see before I got up and preached. Could you imagine the fear in all of your eyes? Shock and awe. Realize how gassy the pastor was. I'm not sure the feet. Why does he do what he did? What was his thinking? Perhaps some of you would have pity on me. <laughs> that was my phone call. <laughs> if you were to be exposed to what you say, what you think, what you do, and it was put out on blast, they say that you are not a Christian by what you show, but by what is not shown. Who you are when no one's watching. That is what makes you a Christian. So Jesus puts them out on blast. And they still be arguing about it. And sitting down, Jesus called the disciples together. Because none of them were like, well, we were saying, who's the best? He says, anyone who wants to be first must be the last and the servant of everyone. I can't get people to come here on time. So he takes a little child. He places them amongst them, and taking the children in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me, and who does not welcome me but the one who sent me. Now watch this. He says, The one that's the servant and has childlike faith, who doesn't get caught up in thoughts, but always comes from a positive perspective towards people. You know, we have to, you have to teach children stranger danger. They have no concept. They see someone, they're like, hey!